Hey, hey, it's time for another Stitchy Tube Tutorial. It's like a tutorial, but it's got tube at the front. And I'm pleased to bring you one of my other Nashville 2018 releases called Candle Chicking. Mm? And it is available not as a kit, but it is available as a chart. Ask your local shop or your favorite internet shop to get you a copy. Uh, my friend Jen also carries it in her shop, and I'll put a link below there if you'd like to get it from her. But please, if you have a shop and you're carrying the candle chicken chart, or you can get it in for people, please comment below so that we can throw some business your way too. Um, I, I don't know if any of y'all remember candle wicking, but candle wicking um, was a craft that was got real popular again, like maybe in the late, late like 70s, early 80s. And I, I know you've seen it. It it was muslin, you know, kind of a cream colored fabric with knots on it in a shape. Usually it was like a heart or a goose or a bow or something kind of country like that. And candle wicking actually dates back to um, the time when settlers were making their way out west in the United States. And, you know, supply lines were not great. And so uh, women who still wanted to stitch had to do make do with what they had and they could get muslin which was used for a lot of different things and they could get candle wick thread to make candles and so they actually would make these designs um, with you know needle and candle wick thread on muslin and that kind of satiated their need to uh, create needlework aren't we lucky that we live <laughs> in a time when it's like hmm how many colors of silks do i need hmm, i don't know this red is kind of too red but um, God bless them, they were making do with what they had. And so in the late 70s, early 80s, candle wicking became kind of popular again, and it just kind of disappeared. It was very, it was very country, it was very country looking. And I thought it would be fun to kind of maybe bring it into the new millennium with um, just kind of an updated look. And so at market, I released uh, Candle Chicking, which is this project here. And I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. I think it turned out really cute. And so you can see, that the it, the idea is there it's knots on fabric and it's it's i didn't use muslin i used um just an off-white quilting fabric you definitely could use muslin but i feel like muslin sometimes really looks thin um, and sometimes a little splotchy it's a very inexpensive fabric and so i kind of just upgraded a little and went to just a little bit nicer fabric and then i just used dmc pearl cottons in three different colors now you could use any kind of thread you can use thread that you've got around the house you could do the chicken and browns purples reds greens, whatever. And once you do one, you're going to have the tools to know how to make these kind of projects on your own. And so I'm going to show you the tricky bits. If you buy my chart, you'll get a complete list of all the supplies that you need, as well as step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. I'm going to show you in this tutorial the pieces where I really feel like people would benefit from actually seeing the process. Um, I even include like the paint colors. Now this Display, I got at Hobby Lobby in the spring of 2018. Um, not terribly expensive. I thought it was cool because it has like the, the chicken wire. And um, you can see on mine too, I made little paper mache painted eggs to fit in each of the little holes. This is just Spanish moss. I tied a little button on here. I used cotton bowls to decorate. But this tutorial is going to show you how to, how to make the knots and how to finish this circle part so you can attach it to this and the rest of it is really pretty easy um, one of the things that i super enjoyed making was these little um i'm gonna put this down the little eggs um, the paper these are just paper mache eggs that i got in a pack of like 12 or 18 at hobby lobby you can probably find them at any craft store i would grab them now um, but what i did is i painted them rust colored you know because and then i was like oh i kind of want them to look kind of stonish or you know grungy and i took the charcoal color that's listed in my chart painted my hand and then just did this scrambled it around and you can actually on some of them you can actually see like fingerprints and things where my fingers touched and that's that's how I made it look all splotchy like that and that was really fun to get my hands dirty if you don't like doing that of course you could just kind of you know stab it with your paintbrush or whatever but it was fine fun to get it uh, get a little dirty and do that or have maybe some kids come by and they would love to do that I'm sure make these little grungy eggs for you um, but anyway, uh, the, the technique that I'm going to show you on making the, um, this center part is one that you can also use to make pin keeps, ornaments, um, you know, needle books probably, stand-ups, whatever. 
Um, I, you know, a lot of times when I craft, I want to craft right now. And it might be Sunday night and nothing is open. Or it might be midnight and nothing is open. And so a lot of times I have to make do with supplies that I might have around the house. And so you're going to see in this tutorial that some of these supplies are going to be just things that you have that you never would have thought of using. And um, things that you might otherwise throw away. But I'm going to just show you a few other examples of things that I've done where I've used the same technique for making this little stiff card. And then these are just pins that you can just push between the layers. And you'll see how to do this in a bit. It's a lot easier than you think. Um, these I use as ornaments, or actually I have them st stood up in a basket over there where they're just kind of you know up against each other. Um, here's another one. This is a Blackbird Designs pattern that I stitched back in 2009 that again, just use the same technique to make this little stuffed card. And here's another one, uh, Blackbird Designs again that I stitched also in 2009. And it's, it's pretty easy and pretty fun, and it's, it's really inexpensive. So I hope you enjoy the tutorial. I'm going to go, um, some parts of this I've already filmed, and I'm going to go film the other parts. Fitz is going to continue taking a nap behind my shoulder, and we'll get back at it real soon. See you in a bit. Step one in learning how to do candle wicking is to learn how to make a colonial knot. And they're much easier than a French knot. I never could do a French knot very well. Um, the folks from the uh, from Bent Creek actually were the ones that taught me to do a colonial knot probably 24 years ago or something, 23, 22 years ago, something crazy like that. But colonial knots are nice. They do, um, I don't know, they just, for me, they're more, they come out more consistently and they almost look like tiny little flowers. And it's a pretty simple process. You want to take it easy because if you go too fast, sometimes your thread is going to knot up. I am using a needle that I just found in my sewing kit. It's about the length of a tapestry needle, but it has a little bit of a point on the end. And it's got a larger eye to accommodate number eight pearl cotton. I don't know that you necessarily need to go out and buy any kind of a special needle. Maybe look through your sewing kit and see what you've got. If you've got an assortment, you've probably got a needle that's going to work. You want the eye to be big enough where the, the pearl cotton can go through without you know really having to struggle to squeeze it through there and, and then it all gets shredded up. And you want it pointed so that you're definitely making a hole every time you go through. Okay, so I've already done a few here and I'm gonna show you now how to do a colonial knot. You've got your lines already traced on your fabric and you just come up. Now I'm spacing these colonial knots so that they're really pretty much right on top of each other. But let's, let's figure out how to do a colonial knot first. So I'm going to come up through the fabric. I'm going to pull the thread this way towards me, point my needle to the left, but dig it underneath, okay? And then take this and wrap it around. Then point down. Pull this knot so that it's tight and then slide that tight knot down to the fabric. And then you want to hold that knot in place while you pull the thread through. And that's a colonial knot. And I'm going to do a number of these so that you can really get the hang of this. You can slow YouTube down too if you really want to watch this in super slow motion, but I'm going to try to do it real slow. Uh, make sure your fabric is tight. You can use the, the little clips on the edges of your uh, Q snaps. If you squeeze them around towards the back, you can tighten up your fabric and that'll make things easier too. You don't want your fabric to get too bunchy bunchy. Okay, so I'm up and through. I grab my thread. I point to the left, but then I dig underneath. You can hold this here. Take this thread and wrap it over the top. Back down into your fabric. Pull that tight knot down to the base of the fabric. Oop, and then gently pull it through. And there's a pretty little colonial knot. Let's do another one. Now when you go back down, you don't want to go back into the same hole that you came up through. These threads are pretty fine because this is just a quilting fabric. But um, it's going to help keep your knots in place if you go down in a different hole than you came up through. So I'm pulling towards me with the thread pointing to the left, dig under to the right, wrap this around the top, back in to the fabric, pull the knot, slide it down, and through. 
you're going to sometimes have problems probably where uh, your thread is going to want to kind of bunch in on itself. And if you're a cross stitcher, you know all about letting your thread dangle sometimes. It just helps it to kind of unwind. And so you may need to do that with your pearl cotton too, just so it doesn't get too not filled. Towards you, point to the left, dig under to the right, hold, wrap over the top, back down into the fabric. Slide the knot to the base of the fabric, reach through, and pull. And that's how you make a colonial knot. Traditionally, candle wicking is done with a lot of space between the individual colonial knots. And while you definitely could do that, I wanted kind of more of an updated, kind of filled in look. And I started, you know, by just doing these cream colonial knots. And while I liked that, I felt like it needed more just kind of dimension and color. And so I found two more colors of pearl cotton to use. Um, the, the main part of the rooster is done in ecru number eight. And then I've got number 12 pearl cotton in 642 and 644. And so I've got, you know, kind of variations on creamy beige. And so what you do is you first do your colonial knots with the number eight pearl cotton all the way around. And I'm, I'm doing this a little bit at a time, but you can, you know, just do lengths of the cream first and then you can fill in with the other two colors. And you can use other colors. You work from your stash or if you wanna use um, a couple strands of floss, you could do that too, whatever thread you've got. Uh, the first color is ecru and then I fill in with 644. And then lastly, I'll fill in just a smidge more with 642. And you can see if you look, it's hard to get your colonial knots to be right up on top of each other. You're going to have little spaces here, there, and everywhere. But you can see once you start filling in with these other colors, that those lines look kind of more smooth and they almost look like a little hedge of flowers, don't they? That's kind of cool. So this is, um, the number 12 is a thinner thread and I wanted it thinner. I didn't want all the knots to be the same size. I did want to give it kind of that, you know, flower hedge look. And so using your next lightest color, so the medium shade, you're gonna to start to fill in some of these holes. And you're doing the colonial knots the same exact way. So you just come up, whoop, and there's no real right or wrong way to do it. You want it to be kind of random. Don't feel like you have to take a, a measuring tape out and measure and make sure everyone is the same. You want it to be kind of random looking. So pull it towards you, under, scoop it, over, and down. And these colonial knots will be slightly smaller. And you're just kind of looking for spots where, oh, I have a little bit of a gap there. You know, every, every, you know, not as close together as the first colonial knots that you did, but just right alongside these cream ones. And there's a gap there, so I'm gonna fill in there and make a colonial knot. Oh, so you gotta be careful because I'm gonna get a big knot there and then I'm not gonna be able to go through. So patience is key. Um, here's another spot, I'll go here. But you're not, don't worry, there's not, there's not, this isn't counting threads like, like when you're cross stitching. This is, you know, going along a line, working along a line. And so I'm filling in here, here, and here, just wherever to make this kind of second beige color and start to fill in, all right? All right, I finished that, um, you know, the medium color and filled in along here, along the line. And you can see here's all three colors, here's two colors, and then here's what one color looks like. So you can see how much more dimension it gives and it makes the line look, you know, kind of neater and tidier too. Like I said, it's not, this isn't a precise science. You fill in where there are gaps. I'm gonna to point to where um, I put the medium colors. There's one here, here, here. And then I skipped over here, here. Here, here, two together, another one here. So you're just, jump around. It's okay to have a couple next to each other. You want it, random isn't doing it every other knot. You want it to, them to kind of fall in and amongst each other 
and let them land where they will, just like a flower would. So now this is the darkest color. This is the DMC 644 or, you know, whatever color you've chosen. You could definitely do a chicken in other colors. But I'm going to start down here now with this one to go work my way up the chicken's feathers. And I'm doing colonial knots faster now. Um, you will get faster too as you learn how to make them. And there it is. And now these, I'm, I'm not putting as many of these in as I did of the medium color. You want, that's, I mean, at least that's how I'm doing it. You can do it how you like. What am I, what am I saying, trying to tell you how to do things? But I'm just, you know, maybe not quite as often. And every so often, and I'm going to work my way up the line like this. Now, right now I'm working on the edge of a table, but... When I'm done filming here, I'm gonna actually go sit in my stitching chair, watch a little floss tube, and work with this on my lap and it'll be much easier. But hopefully you guys are getting the hang of it and you can kind of see what this is starting to look like. I'm just pretty pleased with it so far. All right, when you're ready to tie off your thread, you're done with a length, you've, you've got to move to a new area, it's very easy to secure your thread on the back. Remember, you're going to have padding underneath, and so if things are a little lumpy and bumpy, that's okay. Um, but you've got all these tiny little stitches on the back that are the spaces in between all of the colonial knots that you just made. And what you can do is just run your needle under a stitch, under another stitch, under another stitch, and I do like three, four, or five of them, like that. And then just go ahead and clip. Okay guys, I got the dryer going, and so we're multitasking. I'm teaching and I'm making. Um, this is a really cool technique, and like I showed you earlier, you can use it to, to make a lot of different things. I've got a bunch of supplies, and this complete supply list is in the chart, so go buy the chart. This is, the basis of this is can you tell? Uh-oh, life cereal. There's the Quaker Oats man. And so um, this is one of those little instances that I'm going to call Inspired by Garbage. And I actually wrote a theme song. It goes like this. Inspired by garbage, inspired by garbage, inspired by garbage. And that's it. So we're super inspired by garbage. And what I did is I took um, a cereal box and a bowl. This is Briar. <laughs> and took a bowl and I traced around the bowl with a pencil. And so what you need to do is just find a bowl or use a compass to make a circle the size that you want your piece. I think my circle for my chicken was about six inches. I made these smaller just because it would be quicker for me to show you the technique. Okay, so you've got four circles. You wanna do four because this is not very thick. Um, it's a little bit bendy and the more layers you do, I know, are you so nice? The more layers that you do, the, um, the sturdier your thing is gonna be. Now, if it makes you a little crazy to use recycled rubbish, you can have your framer cut you some circles out of mat board and that would be very sturdy as well. But this is, like I said, sometimes it's, it's the middle of the night and you wanna craft and this helps you do that. Now, um, here's my ATG gun again and it's super handy. So I just put down a couple of quick little strips and stick my circles together like that. And then I always put like the, um, the, the decorated part on the inside, I guess, so it just it doesn't show if, if your batting would you know, show through. So there, now I've got two, super quick. Then a little bit of quilt batting. This is cotton. Um, you could use a poly too. This is just, I had scraps that were about the right size and I like to you know, not throw too much away. So once again, I use, use my uh, tape gun and I just do that. And then I find it's easier to trim once it's attached. And please ignore any and all cat hair because there's cat hair on everything at my house. If you're allergic, I'm sorry you can never, ever come visit me, but I wish you could. You'll be here in spirit. And so I'm just trimming and trimming and trimming and trimming and trimming. And there you can see that's, that's it. And there's, there we've got one one circle, and so we're gonna do that one more time. Now, um, when I belonged to the Embroiderers Guild, there was a lady, and I, she used a, kind of a similar technique, and she had the great idea to use, <laughs> you know, this is very Midwest. She had the great idea to use Cool Whip lids 
to make these circles because once again, it would be very sturdy. You can't rip it. And if you needed to like spot clean it or if it got wet for some reason, it's, it wouldn't ruin the inside of your ornament or whatever, which I thought that was a great idea. So, you know, save those. It's a good, it's a good excuse to eat, you know, gallons of ice cream because you never know what you can do with those lids. And I'm not being too exact. I'm just, you know, trimming around, trimming around, trimming around. Super easy schmeasy. Bada bing, bada boom. That's what we got. Okay, so um, I did not stitch my candle chicken piece again. Um, so I just thought I would show you just if you, you know, with just another piece of fabric, how to cover it. So um, what you would do is you would center your piece on your fabric or you center your fabric on your, on your circles over the batting with the right side out and you'll just wanna make sure you center it. And once you get it where you like it, you could use those cool little quilting clips or use, um, oh, what do you call them, clothes pins to kind of clip it all together. But what I'm gonna do is just pretend this is centered. Let's see, do I want it more interesting? Do I want some, some of this on there? I don't know, I think I want some of that. I'm just gonna do this. Okay, so I'm gonna flip it upside down and then I'm going to use a little thing called the hot glue gun. And this is not a fancy one. This is probably pretty cheap, but it's low temperature. And the reason it's low temperature is because I always burn myself when I'm using the hot glue gun. So what I'm going to do is I, pu I put a little here, a little here, and I pull it and I pull it, or I put it on one side, one side, and then I'll do this and this, and then I'll hit the corners. And then that'll be good. And then you just want to tug on it a little bit as you go. So I'm going to put down a little glue here pull this over and just kind of smooth it in. And circles are, can be a little bit trickier because um, you know, you're, you're kind of having to gather as you go. But um, as the, the technique that I use for finishing around the edges actually smooths a lot of stuff out. See there, I just stuck my finger in hot glue. So there we go. Okay, so there's that and that. And then I'm gonna go to the other side and glue and pull and pull and pull, kind of gather in. Okay, and now the other side. And again, pull and pull and kind of gather in. You get all these little glue strings. There must be a name for those, I would guess. But you can see already that it's taking shape uh, of the circle. And so I'm gonna um, finish gluing my circles and then I'll be right back. Okay. So I did this really good job of explaining and showing how to sew these circles together. And what I did is I filmed myself just dinging around trying to figure and then I shut it off to film. So I have no footage of what I just did to finish this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it to you and you're going to get it. It's very easy. Here's my little circle. And... Um, to put the two halves together, I uh, trimmed the excess fabric off the back of each of the pieces and then used hot glue just in the middle and, st and stuck the two pieces together. And then you want to use, well, I mean, this is what I do. I use DMC floss or just thread that I've got that actually matches the fabric so that you don't see the stitches. And what I did is I used a contrasting thread so you could kind of see what it looks like. But I use two strands of DMC floss because it's something I typically have around the house and it's very sturdy and I have lots of it and it's cheap. So um, once you get the two halves hot glued together, you're gonna sew the edge. Now the reason I use hot glue um, is because you, you could use like Aileen's Tacky Glue or you know, some things like that, but wet glue with paper often creates lumps and bumps and um, ripples. And then sometimes it makes things kind of soggy and not as stable. And so hot glue just is kind of an instant hold. It's very permanent, like it's really hard to, to undo hot glue, but um, it's very quick and inexpensive. So I do two strands of DMC floss, loop it through the edge a couple of times. And I usually start at the bottom of wherever I am. And then I just make little tiny stitches all the way around. So I just um, in and in and in about an eighth of an inch apart just and just keep turning what you're working on and all the way around. If you run out of DMC, then just go through a couple of times, tuck the tail down inside and then start again with another length. And you could also use just a little drop of glue um, 
to just hold that thread in place. I mean like a tiny little just touch just to hold that in place. Um, but like I said, use a thread that's going to match your fabric and you won't even really see it. But this is, um, that's, that's how I get the two halves together. And then the neat thing about that is that any, you can see this fabric is really tight. And as you sew your way around it, it like pulls the fabric a little tighter, a little tighter, a little tighter. And so it's nice and tight. And then you've got your little circle. Now you're gonna want to attach it to your, whatever it is that you found to attach it to. And what I did is I just attached, I, I sewed a couple of lengths of twine to the back of the fabric of my circle and then just tied it on. You could use wire, you could hot glue the twine on. I, I sewed it on with a little thread. You could use hot glue to glue it on. You could use safety pins if you wanted to. Just any way that you've, you've got to kind of attach that on there is, is how that's gonna work really well for you. Now, like I had said before, this is available right now in the spring of 2018. I don't know how long Hobby Lobby will carry these. I don't know if your Hobby Lobby will have this. If you can't find this, that's okay <laughs> because you could attach this to a lot of different things. I originally thought about attaching it to, um, you can get milk, what do you call it? Like milk canister kind of a thing. You could get a wire basket or a wicker basket, or you could attach it to the side of a box. You could put magnets on it and attach it to your fridge. You could make it into an ornament and hang it from a tree or from a doorknob. There are a lot of different things that you could put this on and use your imagination. Go to your local craft store or go to the thrift shop and see what you can find to put this in. You obviously could frame it too, but that's kind of boring. It's kind of fun to make something like this. And you know, this, this is neat because it's got a hanger on it. So you can actually hang it from your wall, which is what I have been doing here at home is just hanging it from the wall and it looks super cute and fun. Uh, I will also mention that I did paint the top of this because it was just of shiny metal and the directions for that are also in the instructions. But I've shown you how to do the tricky parts and I know you can do this. I hope that you use uh, that technique. I don't really have a name for it <laughs> and I'm sure other people do it. That's just my way of doing it. I'm sure other people do things that are similar. Um, the, that's, the, that's the technique that I use to make all these little squares and things, well, no, whatever. All right, so I hope you had fun. Thank you for supporting my designs. Happy stitching, be well, and stay happy. Bye-bye.